Uh, so my name is Jessica Rose, and I haven't got the accent from it, but I've come over from the UK. I'm from the US originally, and I'm really, really passionate about open access to technical education and Iceland. <laughs> uh, so far as I'm concerned, it's God's own country, so Iceland's pretty great. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about imposter syndrome. And I'm aware it's a little bit of a hot take right now. So everybody's heard a talk about imposter syndrome or given a talk about imposter syndrome. So this is actually the last time I'm giving this talk before I retire it. Cool. And because I am really, really bad about running fast, I love to talk fast, I love to just race through things, I've given myself a little bit of a challenge and I've timed myself live tweeting the event. So if you're going to, everybody does, if you're going to mess around on your phone a little bit and chill out, you can catch up with it at uh, Jesslyn Rose. And nobody's ever going to watch the video and look at the timings of the tweets at the same time. So as long as you guys don't call me out for the missed timings, it should work really well. Um, before I got into technology, I was a teacher. So there's going to be a little bit of overly <coughs> earnest, slightly embarrassing audience participation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just to get you started, I'm going to say yo, and you guys are going to say yo, and we'll get the whole we do things on command. Yo! No. Hey, I'm all right with that. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about cognitive biases today. Class, cognitive biases? Uh, I'm not even yo. Uh, just name one. Uh, <laughs> can anybody name a cognitive bias? Some quality. Yeah, huh? Anybody else? Confirmation bias. No, any more? All right, you, you, you two are my favorite students. Um, <laughs> so cognitive biases are just when your brain is giving you illogical, unhelpful information. They're patterns of thought where it's not helping you, and it's usually based on faulty data. So any kind of cognitive bias is really just your brain giving you a gentle troll. And why I'm talking about cognitive biases. So if these are th processes your brain just automatically does, if we can't fix them, we can't really fix them, if we can't really interrupt them, if they're going to be there no matter what, why talk about them? And the first thing is to be aware of a cognitive bias is to give you the best chance to do a little bit of debugging. If you're aware that sunk cost fallacy is an issue, maybe six, seven, twelve thousand dollars into a project, you'll stop and be like, well. Uh, and the second reason for talking about cognitive bias is they're just really cool. The fact that your brain is not on your side is a really, really interesting thing to take a look at. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at, and the main topic they talk, is imposter syndrome. Uh, anybody, everybody's heard of imposter syndrome? Yeah, sorry. This part will be boring, but we'll, we'll push along. Imposter syndrome is, it's not really a condition. It's not a static thing. It's this feeling. It's this quiet, cold, sick, sad feeling that you have no idea what you're doing. Everybody else looks like they know what they're doing. And Jesus Christ, they're going to catch you. <laughs> um, so I've gone ahead and I've cribbed this from a gentleman on Twitter at Run David Run. And he's talking about imposter syndrome being this condition where you think you know this tiny subset of what everybody else knows. And he's saying, realistically, it's a little bit different because everybody's overlapping. And I think that's starting to get into the right track. But I really think imposter syndrome is about comparing the whole of your experiences, the whole of your skill set, to the perceived skill set and the perceived ability of your peers. So it's not about comparing your actual skill set to Mary's actual skill set. It's comparing the whole of what you felt to the small bit of what she's doing that she's broadcasting publicly. And I think that one thing that's made imposter syndrome a little bit more difficult is the, the degree to which we access other people's lives via social media. Uh, anybody on Facebook? All right, Twitter? Uh, Pinterest? Yay! <laughs> Sorry, it's usually like the girls in the room that keep their hands up, so I'm really glad to see that, that uh, chick. Instagram. And Vine? Uh, the, the cool kids. <laughs> on social media, do you... <laughs> on social media, do you guys tend to write about, post about, take videos, the really, really shit stuff that happens? 
yeah, you tend to take pictures of nice food, nice restaurants, that award you won. This, and it creates this image that's really intimidating for other people. Everybody sees you as a complete, successful, amazing individual. How many of you guys feel like a complete, amazing, successful individual? <laughs> I love that you're just like, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so it's really difficult because we're all broadcasting. We're all working so hard to be like, oh, I'm cool, and never really feel that way inside. Uh, so before we go on, I'm going to talk a little bit about who imposter syndrome impacts. Uh, and we talked about me being a teacher, and this is, again, going to be very embarrassing, but hands up. Who's ever felt like you have no idea what you're doing, and you're doomed, and everything's wrong? And this is the best part. Keep your hands up and take a look at everybody who does not have their hand. Oh, those went up fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd say pretty much everybody. Sorry, I'm going to catch up with my notes so it doesn't go wrong. Help. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Cutler and Imes did one of the most um, widely disseminated studies on imposter syndrome, and they focused exclusively on high-achieving women. And it's one of those things, confirmation bias. If you study high-achieving women, you're going to come to a conclusion that high-achieving women tend to suffer more from imposter syndrome. So they did an extended study. So over five years, they kept in contact with 150 high-achieving women and sort of worked out their... their um, ideas on imposter syndrome from there. But they did their research back in the 70s. In the 90s, we got six or seven great waves of research saying that actually, it's not really high achieving women, it's women of color. And then we said, you know what, it's visible minorities across the achievement spectrum. But we did a survey just now, and we got pretty much everybody. So what's with that? What's with that weird data? We've got the official studies conflicting with what you guys say. And I think there's really two big reasons for that. A lot of the studies have focused on the way women feel and women interact with their own skill sets and their own competencies. And I think even more than the way women internalize skill sets, it's got quite a bit to do with the way people interact with language and gender. So when you see women saying, I feel like I'm a fraud, I feel like I don't belong, I do think part of that is it's more socially acceptable for women to say, I feel anything. So I think the guys who are timidly raising your hands might feel it just as intensely as women in the, the industry, but maybe aren't as uh, encouraged to speak about it. And I think the second issue is, is not being part of the in-group. So when you're part of a successful industry, when you're part of a successful business, and you don't feel like you've got a handle on things. Being able to look around you and see people who look like you, talk like you, sound like you, are willing to embrace you in sort of a larger shared consciousness. That, that got a little borgy. How about a, a larger shared identity is a little bit less creepy, but still pretty creepy. It makes it a little bit easier. If you're the only person on your team, if you're the only person in your company, if you're the only person that you know doing what you're doing, you're not going to get that kind of social feedback. You're not going to get the reinforcement that being part of the in-group gives you. So we think, yeah, it impacts everybody. Women talk about it a bit more. Being part of an out-group makes it more difficult. It's really tempting to say, let's move on and talk about how to fix imposter syndrome. How do we address this? Oh, God, let's fix it now. But I'm going to stop and ask a couple more questions. So I think the big question before we talk about how do we fix it is what is it actually doing? So computer sciences, we really love, do we really love data? Two of us really love data, we're cool. Uh, we really love data and I want to take a little bit of a closer look at what imposter syndrome actually means for results. So when we come back to the Cutler and Ives data, they found four major self-reported issues with women who were high achieving and reported imposter syndrome. And the first two really resonated with me where they found that women who are high achieving in their industry reported an incredible amount of fear around the skill sets they found deficient, themselves deficient in. So I don't feel especially good about my front end development 
skills. And I'm terrified that somebody's going to find out. So I've just told you, you can't shame me. And another big one is that they found women self-reported that they would engage less in activities that were likely to directly challenge that skill set in front of their peers. So they would, I don't know, not that we're talking about me, maybe get sick the night before a hackathon. <laughs> but they also found that these same women who reported an incredible amount of fear and an incredible amount of skill-specific avoidance also reported having developed charming social behaviors. And that sounds a little bit flip and a little bit useless. But I think charming social behaviors for the mid to late 70s turn into effective soft skills when we say it today. So in order to cope and work around skills that they found they didn't really have the ability to perform in on the spot, on demand, they would work on communication. They would work on teamwork. And they actually found these women self-reported extended hours. So they reported doing additional time in the office, additional time working on their skill sets, and reported themselves working harder than their peers, which I thought was really quite interesting. And in 1990, we had Corazelli and Major come in. And these two women did a really, really great study on the impact of imposter syndrome. So here we had, before we had people self-reporting, say, oh, you know what I feel, you know what I think. Here we had two sets of university students sat down. And some reported feeling extreme imposter syndrome. And a control group who were just like, nah, I'm fine, I got this. And they found that the imposter syndrome group reported lower self-esteem, lower satisfaction with their scores after they were complete, but that both groups performed in step. There was no major variation between either of the end test scores. But the people who had imposter syndrome felt worse coming in, and they felt worse with their results. Um, yeah, I think it's really difficult to go too hard into the data for sort of fluffy social sciences stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal anecdotal experience. So I work with a lot of adult learners in the technology area. And I find, again, especially folks who don't fit the traditional tech mold, uh, the vast undervaluing of their own skill sets. I find that people who feel they don't belong don't ask for enough money, don't ask for promotions, don't ask for attention. And I also find that they don't call attention to their projects enough. And this has incredible individual costs. So when we talk about the people who are most likely to feel the strongest that they suffer from imposter syndrome, we talk about women, we talk about people of color, we talk about people whose first language isn't their contextual language. We also see people who are underpaid even in the same roles which is, I think, a combination of individual undervaluing of their own skill set and sort of maybe some structural cultural issues, which is a little, little bit. And this has incredible costs for the industry. Has anybody seen the, what is it, the Forta Cloud advertisement for hosting that's been going around Twitter? Exactly two people are like, Ugh. if you don't have a diverse set of perspectives addressing your product and working on your product, you're going to do really stupid things. Every problem I've ever run into in computer science, every big meaningful problem, has been an issue of perspective. And not having enough perspective on the ground is going to cost the industry overall. <coughs> OK. <laughs> so we've got through all that. What can we do collectively to sort of pick people up? What can we do as individuals to help other individuals and communities to sort of sort things out a bit. The first thing I would say is, so who feels, we, we can do little hands, who feels fairly secure in their role right now? Who feels like they're at a good place in their career? You feel pretty safe. All right. The best thing, every single one who had your hand up, I want you to admit when you are afraid sometimes. I want to admit when you screw up sometimes. Because people from the outside just see your success. They don't see you quietly swearing at the computer at 3 in the morning. They don't see you terrified before a meeting. They don't see you eating a cupcake out of your handbag before a pitch. Um, people, it's like one time, come on. Uh, they just see you doing these amazing things, getting these awards, giving, ooh, giving these talks. 
And they don't really see that it took a lot of trial and error to get there and that you're not perfect. <laughs> and I want, not you guys, because you guys would never do this. I want everybody to just stop being jerks. The onboarding process for coming in tech technology is really, really difficult for new folks. I've heard really good, really amazing, really well-meaning people say, wait, so you didn't know how to do that? Which is crippling for someone. Make it a safe space to admit you don't know what you're doing and then go giggle about it later. And if you want to do something to help other people, act as a support. So if you're interacting with people who don't understand their value, don't understand their worth, and you have an ongoing relationship with them, give honest, critical, but positive feedback. I think we're so caught up in letting people know when they've screwed up, when we've screwed up, that we never stop to say, oh wait, that was legitimately awesome. More of that, please. So create an environment where you're acting as a mirror and reflecting people's actual value. And if you've got close contact with them, give them a little push to be like, hey, hey, do you, do you, do you not want to move into a higher paid job? Because seriously, if it's you, if you feel like you have no idea what you're doing and they're going to find you and they're going to catch you, Jesus Christ, oh, oftentimes when hearing that, oh, it's imposter syndrome, adds an extra layer of panic. Not only do you not know what you're doing, but now something's wrong with you and you have to fix it. And No, it's cool. It's just your brain being an asshole. It's just a weird, creepy, useless, maybe useless thing your brain is doing. Take a deep breath. It's not your fault. It's not anything you have to fix. Eat a cupcake out of your handbag. It's going to be cool. The things I'd say to individuals are try and recognize not necessarily the feeling. Oftentimes, the feeling you can't do anything about. Recognize behavioral patterns where you're limiting yourself. So I've stopped getting sick before hackathons. Um, and get into loops, get into social networks and supportive environments where you're creating an ecosystem of being good. If you're surrounded by people who aren't helpful, who are tearing you down, who are making your life worse, move. I think PHP's fairly fluffy and snuggly and everybody's cool. Of course, yeah, mostly. I like how everybody was just like, well, yeah, there's this one guy, but aside from that. <laughs> Get yourself into an environment where you're surrounded by people who are doing good for you and don't neglect to do good for them. There is something I absolutely do not want you to do at any point, and I swear to God, if you ever do, I will find you. Would you guys rock up to this person and ask about their pregnancy? I, I, I see that a couple people have done this in the past and asked when the baby was due and it's gone wrong. Do not label imposter syndrome from anybody else. Don't come up to somebody who's worried, who's got concerns, who's asking for something, who's asking for some more support and say, no, it's imposter syndrome. It's not helpful. One of the most difficult things in talking about imposter syndrome is the fact that technology is amazing. It's brilliant. It's beautiful. We're making things out of words but some of it's a little bit broken. And when somebody comes to you and says, do you know what, the culture doesn't make me feel like I fit in here, or I feel like my contributions are being undervalued, I feel like I don't have access to the resources I need, telling somebody that their very real concerns are imposter syndrome is just gonna get them adding your name to a list somewhere. Just be like, when I go off, that's I. <laughs> so be really careful not to put labels on other people for them. It's really patronizing and just not ideal. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole time we've been talking about imposter syndrome like it's a negative idea, it's a negative construct to itself. But I'm going to stop and say maybe we've been looking at imposter syndrome through the wrong lens. Yes, it can limit us. Yes, there's negative things to it. But you know what? Some people self-report working harder. I'm going to say maybe there's another lens we can take a look at imposter syndrome through. Does anybody know about Dunning-Kruger? Yeah. Uh, who knows about Dunning-Kruger? Okay. 
So Dunning-Kruger is one of my favorite research studies of all times because as soon as I heard it, I just went, oh, I know that guy. And Dunning-Kruger is a research study that came out of a crime. So there was a gentleman who robbed two banks in broad daylight. And before robbing these banks, he had covered his face with lemon juice. Has anybody ever used lemon juice as invisible ink? <laughs> there we go. So the gentleman was really surprised, a little bit confused, good natured, and he was just begging the police to know how they identified him. And two gentlemen who were working in psychology, who were coming into uh, a bit of grant money, as you do, wanted to have a question to answer. And were bickering over this, this new paper article about some idiot who put lemon juice on his face and asking, in the grand scientific way you ask, do stupid people know they're stupid? And to answer this question, they did something amazing. They gave 2,500 people an aptitude study that covered a multitude of different points. And then before giving them their scores, asked them to plot out where they think they did relative to their peers. And one of the best things about talking about the study is you get to say quartile, which is a wonderful word. And they found that the least able rated themselves artificially high. So the dumbest people you know, your brother-in-law, that guy at the office, that weird guy on the bus, they think they are geniuses. They think they know better than you, they think they are better than you, and you get sort of an inverse X. So the better you do, the less likely you are to artificially inflate your worth. They came out and said, you know what, I think the inept is the gentlest way to say it. The least skilled, they don't recognize their own lack of skill. They just don't have the cognitive abilities to see what they don't have. Furthermore, they fail to recognize genuine skill in others. So not only do they think they're amazing, they think you guys are really dumb. They fail to recognize the incredible, beautiful enormity of their own failures. They have no sense of scope. And the best thing is, it's completely possible to fix. You can totally fix somebody with Dunning-Kruger if you give them the training that they don't need and they won't take. So what I'm saying is that I don't think imposter syndrome is necessarily something by itself. I don't think it's this thing weighing on us and holding us back. I think it's probably the best way you can tell that you're not a moron. I think that imposter syndrome is this ugly, weird, beautiful, helpful tool. And I'm going to go give you guys just a really quick bite-sized takeaway, just in case we did have any Dunnings and or Krugers. I want you to be really, really cool to everybody. But I don't necessarily expect you guys to be cool to everybody. I'm not cool to everybody. Just don't be assholes to newbies. Or anybody, but newbies. We'll start there. I want you to keep in mind that the people you're really intimidated by, the folks who are succeeding, they're doing all of these things, they are just as afraid of the things you're doing, and they have no idea what they think is going on. And I want you to find something that works for you. I want you to find your own coping net mechanisms, not for the feeling that you're not successful or the feeling you have no idea what's going on, because you can't fix that without getting real dumb. I want you to find something that helps break you out of the patterns of behavior that come from feeling inadequate. Personally, I, I, tiny potato. <laughs> cool, and I've probably raced through incredibly quickly, but if you want to bother me, I'm at Twitter. I've got a recap on this incredibly awkward hashtag. Um, and if you ever feel like you want to get bullied into doing projects where you're helping learners do more or helping populations that are not traditionally found in tech, hit me up at either Open Code Club or Transcode and I'll bully you guys into helping out. <laughs> uh, did you guys have any questions? Um, so admitting your mistakes and being honest about things that you screwed up is cool. Um, 
But what if you have a manager who is a dickhead and doesn't like that and thinks that your performance is awful if you did something wrong? I would... I mean, it's okay for the, the tech to work within that yeah. cloud, but then there are the suits. Who oh, yeah. Sure. Hypothetically, because I've never been in that situation, uh, you wind up looking at the Wikipedia page for Dunning-Kruger every day um, to be like, oh, that guy. Um, don't necessarily admit publicly, like, hey, I screwed up. Hey, I don't know what, that's career suicide at times. But if you say to yourself and you say to your peers and you say to your immediate working environment, I'm not feeling especially confident with this particular thing right now. I think being able to clearly articulate what you would need is a lot more helpful in a professional environment than just saying, <gasps> <laughs> uh, did anybody else have any questions? Cool, I'll let you guys go. <laughs>